Hello and welcome to Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I interview entrepreneurs doing startups across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on companies that have some relationship to Latin America. My guest today is Federico Vega, founder of Cargo X, which can be described as the Uber for trucks in South America. Federico has an amazing and inspiring story. He was born in a small town in Argentine, Patagonia, and now runs one of the largest trucking companies in Latin America, and was the first tech company in Latin America to get an investment from Goldman Sachs. We talk about how he went from Patagonia to Buenos Aires to the UK, where he started a business, which he parlayed into a university scholarship and an eight-year career in finance. Find out how he built his startup from his first office, a bathroom stall at his day job in London, his decision to go back to Latin America that took him down to Argentina, Chile, and now Brazil, and how he's dealt with the ups and downs of startup life, including business success, business failure, and doing whatever it takes, including sleeping in a car to get his business off the ground. We also cover his advice on how to get a startup off the ground, how to get investment, and his advice to Silicon Valley investors about why they should be looking at Latin America. Federico's story is amazing and is filled with pearls of wisdom that I hope you find as interesting and inspiring as I did. Enjoy. Hey, Fede, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thank you. So where are you in the world today? So today I'm based in Brazil, out of Sao Paulo. And where are you from originally? I was born in Patagonia, Argentina, in a small city called Puerto Madryn, which is in the south of the country, in the south of Patagonia, actually. So how many people more or less would live there? There, 40,000 people. Wow. Yeah, so it's a small city. Yeah, it's a pretty small city. And so how did you, what's your business today? What are you working on? So today we are working on what is called, it's, it's an online freight broker or data-driven freight broker. It's a transportation business, a trucking business that doesn't own any assets. We don't own any trucks. Now in the States, the, this business model is being called the Uber for trucks because of the similarities. So we are a trucking company. So basically, you allow a trucker to never have an empty load. Yeah, so we have uh, trucks that have a mobile app similar to Uber. And then we have clients that have a load and we match that excess capacity in the truck with existing freight in the market. And then we use technology and, and machine learning to make sure that the trucker never runs empty. So if we have, for example, 500 trucks going from San Pablo up north, when the when the truck leaves San Pablo and, and probably the truck is going to travel for three days, at the moment that the truck leaves San Pablo, we already start providing that trucker freight so that when the trucker arrives to the city and delivers the freight, already has freight booked to go back home. So in Brazil, the opportunity we saw is that in Brazil, 40% of the time, the trucks are running empty. They have excess capacity. So we are utilizing that excess capacity to move freight around and we decrease the cost of transportation. The trucker makes more money at the end of the month because they make a better use of, of their trucks. And we also have social and environmental impact because we save on CO2 emissions. And we also have less trucks on the road because 40% of the time the, the truck is running empty actually. So and you're we, one of the you're one of the biggest trucking companies now in Brazil or Latin America, right? Yeah. We are probably today by amount of trucks and revenue, we are probably one of the top trucking companies in Brazil. So I'll go back and we'll talk more about the business in a, in a few minutes here. But I'm curious, how did a guy from a small town in Patagonia in Argentina end up running a trucking company, one of the biggest ones in Latin America in Brazil? Yeah, I'm wondering the same every day. <laughs> uh, I uh, I never set up myself to run a trucking company. I never had the idea of, you know, I'm going to run a trucking company. But, you know, this is where I ended. I was born in Patagonia. I studied in Patagonia. Then when I was 17 years old, I went to Buenos Aires to study. I didn't like to study that much. So I saved, I started working. I saved some money and then I went to leave to travel around. And when I was in London, I... I start work at a university and then I like I like the the life of students at university and then I I did a course in in economics then I did my master's degree in England and then I start working in investment banking 
but I always wanted to start a company. So I started looking for ideas that I could to start the company. And then I came back when I started doing this research, I, I was always thinking like the States, Europe and developed economies are much more competitive. There is less space to innovate. And obviously because I'm from South America, I knew that South America is very inefficient and there is a lot of innovation that, that we, the Latin American guys that are living abroad could bring back to, to the region to make everyone's lives better and solve problems, real problems that exist. And when you solve the problem, you are actually building a business. You, you, you have a business opportunity there. So the two main problems in, in Latin America are where at the time payments and finance and online payments and then enabling or improving logistics because of what I said before. 40% of the time, the trucks are running empty in Brazil. We have 2.6 million trucks in Brazil. So that's a lot of trucks running empty. So you um, had you had a pretty fast trajectory from deciding you didn't really like school in in Argentina to working to ending up in a finance job. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to do that? Yeah, I simply didn't want to study. I found it boring. I knew I had to study anyway. I had a lot of pressure from my family to study, so I started studying in Buenos Aires. But at the same time, I started working, so I saved money. And then I said, I'm going to take some holidays and I just went traveling. But my idea, my idea wasn't to take holidays. I just went traveling, not knowing what to do. And then I started a small business inside a university fixing bicycles. I liked bicycle a lot, bicycles a lot. So I was fixing bicycles at the university. And then I met a lot of students. I liked the life that the students have there. And then I applied for scholarship that I won. And, and with that, with that um, support, financial support, I was able to to join university and, and, and start to study economics. And when I was out of the university, uh, an investment bank called JP Morgan approached me. They basically offered me a job. So I took the job because I needed money. And, and I also took a lot of debt when I was at university, but I wanted to start a company. I started working at JP Morgan. I thought if I do one year here, I'm going to be able to pay my debt. But then you know, I got into the investment banking world and then you start getting a nice salary and then it, it becomes harder and harder to leave. So I worked for JP Morgan like for eight years. And at some point I thought maybe if in 10 years or 20 years, I want to be like one of those big bosses that were working next to me at JP Morgan, if that was what I really wanted to do and have a nice house and a nice job. Or, or if I really wanted to leave and do something else and I was starting to get old. So I thought, you know, I have to leave the bank now. I, I need to leave the money on the table and do something that I really enjoy. I, I wasn't enjoying finance. So you broke out of the golden handcuffs and then decided you wanted to start a business. What did your family and friends back in Argentina think when you were leaving this really good job in, in the UK? Yeah. Well, people think you're crazy because you are actually living like especially when you study econom economics your friends have similar backgrounds sometimes because you make friends at university and then those friends you made at the university they will look at you and say you're you are nuts because you are it's so hard to get into investment banking and you are gonna leave it's not good because it's gonna be tough to come back when and my family the same is uh, i think investment banking from the outside it seems to be like a very good job to have so your parents maybe my parents were happy that i was working for jp morgan which is a good brand to work for and so when you quit did you already know you were going to do this trucking business or did you just know you wanted to start something i researched different markets for a long time and then i start liking logistics because you actually move things around my dad is an architect so he builds stuff and he always hated bankers by the way. So he used to say to me, look, I build a building and it's there and I change the city. And when I pass away, the building is going to be there. You can touch it. Investment bankers don't do nothing. You just, you know, buy uh, stocks, you keep it and then you sell it more expensive. That's not adding value. And then after some time, I start feeling like that. Like I wanted to do something that you can actually touch. And then I discovered that in the States, there were these freight brokers that were changing the way that freight moves around. 
And then I start liking logistics more and more when I start discovering this business. Basically, what logistics do is to enable to move things from one place to another and enable people to access those products in a more efficient way and more efficiently call it faster and at a cheaper cost. So I thought it was cool, the fact that, you know, like now we have thousands of trucks traveling around the country that, you know, they are our trucks in a way because we set up those trucks to, to move around. So that's what I like at Logistics. In 2010, I started working on the platform myself. So I had like someone told me at that time I had two jobs. During the day, I had a job that was giving me money that was investment banking. And overnight, I had a job that was taking all my money away that was a startup. <laughs> so I started in 2010 as a part-time at night on my own for a year. And the business didn't go anywhere. And by the end of 2011, two years after, I was like, okay, I have to give up the job if I want this to work because... At some point during 2011, I was running the job from the toilet at JP Morgan. I bought the first 3G iPad, and <laughs> then I was going into the disabled toilets all the time to do. I hired some developers in Argentina, and I was doing conference calls with the iPad and looking at the websites from the iPad. And then I started getting like, you know, I, I start becoming unproductive at my job, and then I start spending more and more time on the on the disabled toilets. So. <laughs> I reached a point where I had to leave or I was going to get sucked. You had to upgrade your office out of the bathroom. Yeah. So um, where did you go next? Did you launch it in Brazil directly or did you launch somewhere else first? No. So for every Latin American entrepreneur that is not Brazilian, they call Latin America everything but Brazil because Brazil is too complex compared to the rest of Latin America. And here people speak a different language. So... Like every other Latin American guy, I thought, I'm going to do this for a Latin- copycat for Latin America. And Latin America is not Brazil. Brazil is the last one. And I'm going to start, you know, in Argentina, Chile, Mexico, Colombia. So we won Startup Chile, this program run by, by the Chilean government. We got $40,000 investment. And I went to Chile and I developed the company there. I, I hired the first employees, full-time employees. And the company didn't go anywhere. We started in Chile, then expanded to Argentina. When I was in Argentina, I realized that unless I move into Brazil, I was never going to be able to raise more than a million dollars because no one was interested to invest big money in the region, but in Brazil. All the VCs were in Brazil. So we expanded to Brazil. And when we expanded the business to Brazil, I realized that Brazil was way more difficult than I expected. I didn't speak Portuguese. So I moved to Brazil, I learned Portuguese, and then when I was there, I realized that our business idea wasn't that good. We were not solving a problem that existed. The actual problem was very different to what I thought. And the problem was that trucks were running empty all the time, and my platform was created only to save money, but it wasn't created to utilize the excess capacity that already existed in the market. We save on trucking costs today because it's a consequence of utilizing the excess capacity that exists in the market. So when I moved to Brazil, I changed the business model completely. So we have to shut down the company and open the company again. And then we started all over again in 2013. Had you raised any money previous to that or just the Startup no. Chile? No, we raised Startup Chile and then we raised NXTP Labs, which is a small startup accelerator in Argentina. But it was little amount of money, like $25,000. So when we moved to Brazil and we decided to shut down the company because we got it completely wrong, I was still interested in logistics. I started learning where the problems were, but we just went in the right in the opposite direction to what we should have done. So we shut down the company. We ran out of money. We had to shut it down. And once we shut it down, I stayed here in Brazil, just trying to understand how to build a company that solves an actual real problem. And that's how five months later, we started all over. I started all over again. At that time, it was only me. And so take me through the process of you by yourself. You've got the idea and you start going again. What did you do first? Shut the company down. After that, I was getting some. I was still in Argentina when we shut the company down. We ran out of money. We couldn't raise money. 
but I didn't move to Brazil at the time. I was traveling to Brazil and starting to, un- like the company Golden Run Pub in Brazil because we were not solving an actual problem. It was a nice thing, but it, it was never going to be a multi-billion business. So we decided it's done. At the time, I already, when I ran out of money, I invested $40,000 of my own money. After that, I sold my flats and I invested the whole money of my flat into the company. And then we actually ran out of money, like properly. And you didn't, what made you keep deciding that you wanted to start something new rather than, you know, going back to a finance job? I wanted to do a company. I hated the idea of going back to work for a corporation. The idea was that I was going to create a company and that never changed. I wanted to, to build the company. So I, I stay and I kept, kept trying. So you learned Portuguese, you figured out the business model that you think made sense and you started going, did you go and start getting your first clients first or did you go out and raise money? When the company was shut, I had my car. So I drove to San Pablo from Buenos Aires. I actually drove to San Pablo from Patagonia because when I ran out of money, I went back to Patagonia to to live in my parents' house. So there I took my dad, gave me his, he lent me his car and I drove his car from Puerto Madryn to San Pablo. That takes like like a week drive. And I arrived to San Pablo. And then I stay in a hotel at the beginning. And then when I ran out of money for the hotel, I, I managed to... I was working out of Starbucks. So I rent parking space for the car. So I was sleeping in the car, showering at the gym, and then working out of Starbucks for three months. Wow. And there, my former boss from JP Morgan, after I asked him several times, he decided to help with money. So first he lent me some money and then he convinced his, his friend to invest and they became the, the first investors. After that, when he invested in, in an event, I met the former CEO of DHL that also invested. And there we raised like $50,000, something like that. NXTP, the, this startup accelerator that invested in the first company, invested again. And then I, someone introduced me to a lawyer. And when I went to see a lawyer, the guy was like, he charged like $1,000 per hour. It's an American lawyer that, that happened to, to like Latin America. And then I, I went to see the lawyer knowing that I couldn't pay for the lawyer. And somehow I left the meeting with him saying that him and his, his best friend or brother we're going to invest $150,000. So all in all, we raised first $50,000 and then an an extra $200,000. And with that money, we started here in Brazil. So what year was that? May 2013. So we're now four years on. Can you walk me through the next big step to the next milestone that you had? Yeah. So, well, we we spent almost the whole year at Starbucks anyway, it just didn't change that much. We stay working out of Starbucks. I hire two guys, Brazilian guys, and then a developer in Argentina. And things didn't move that well from there. Like we run out of money again the following year, but we had some users, but they didn't pay any money. Then I met VC called Valor Capital. And they said they were looking for startups in the trucking space. We were the only ones, so they didn't have many choices. But we were not doing that well. So they said, look, okay, we the minimum we invest is a million dollars, but we are going to give you like little money. And then if you show that you can hit the targets, we will give you more and we are going to go like that. So they actually end up deploying a million dollars. And they, are, they deploy a million dollars step by step, which is rubbish because you hire employees and then you don't know if you are going to be able to pay those employees or not. It just depends whether you hit the targets or not, that they will give you more money. Then we we moved to an actual office and and we start growing. And after, I think it was 2014 that we ran out of money again. When we ran out of money again, we had to fire a lot of people. We just couldn't raise raise money. It was tough because Brazil was entering in, in a crisis. And we just had to keep a very lean operation for some time. But we had enough money to run a very lean operation, but we didn't have money to build an actual company. So it wasn't as nasty as as the two times we ran out of money before, but it was still hard because we had to get rid of everyone and, and slow down the company. 
what was the turning point that started to make it take off? The turning point was at some points I asked some friends for money. When I was desperate, I went back to my boss at JP Morgan. I started asking for money to everyone and, and no one will, will give me money. And at some point I met one of the founders of Uber. And then someone told the guys from Valor Capital told this guy from Uber about me and the story. He liked the logistics space. He wanted to meet me because he liked the story that we had and, and that we've been trying for so long and, and we kept going. I met him. He saw that there was a good opportunity there. But this is 2016, last year, early last year. And then, you know, our numbers were good. We were just not able to execute because of the lack of money. So he said, look, I would like to put some money here, but I would like to become involved in the company. I will help you out with technologies. He's a founding CTO of Uber. And we will make this happen. So he put money and Valor Capital still... Valor Capital was always trust us a lot. So Valor Capital said we will put some money too. They actually brought the guy on board in a way. And then we just raised more money there. We raised like $4 million or something like that. Because we didn't have money before. We had to make sure that our business model worked. We didn't have any other thing to do. We had time to do everything very slowly and to improve our technology. So by the time the $4 million arrived, we understood the industry very well. Our technology was strong and we were prepared to take the challenge. So when the money arrived, we knew what to do with the money. We were not wasting the money away. And the company started growing and we grew very, very quickly. I think we closed that round in February 2016. And then like three or four months later, we engaged Goldman Sachs to invest, the investment bank. There, we, they invested an extra $10 million. And, and that was easy because the company was growing and the $10 million were deployed on growth. They were not deploying on product market fits or anything like that. By the time the guy from Nubra arrived, we already had product market fits. We had problems to scale with the money we were able to scale. And with those $10 million, we scale a lot. And then by having a, an investor like Valor Capital and Goldman behind us that have big pockets, we were able to continue growth and, and they were able to invest more money. And that Goldman Sachs investment is, is interesting because I think I read that that was their first investment in a LATAM tech company. Is that right? Yeah, because this is their own money is off. So yeah, this is a group of Goldman that invests their own money. And yeah, we are the first. That, that was weird because I remember going to the States and it's not like they came and invested. We saw a lot of investors. Out of all the investors we saw, we thought Goldman was the less likely investor to invest. First, because the level of investments they make are actually higher. They are not an investor that is active in Latin America. And also because the day we, yeah, it was because of that. And, and the way we arrived, we were wearing shorts because we lost, we were out of Chicago and we were supposed to go into the plane and there, wa there was a storm and we just couldn't go into the plane. And then there was a smaller plane taking off and we took the smaller plane, but we couldn't take our luggage. So we had to fly to <laughs> New York. We arrived in the morning with no clothes. And there was no time to go shopping. We had to go straight to the meeting. So it, it was a bit of an awkward meeting, the first meeting. <laughs> That's an amazing story. What advice would you give to other founders that are in Latin America or in Brazil or even just outside of Silicon Valley in New York on raising money now that you've been through a lot of different fundraising processes and come out the other end pretty successful? Probably the best advice is don't waste time on networking events. I don't do networking events. I very rare join any networking events about entrepreneurs. What I do is I spend my time in my industry, which means tracking. I don't want to meet the CEO of a food delivery company. That's, you know, it just doesn't add value to your business. You have very limited amount of time and you need to focus on your in industry. And you need to develop a network in your industry. And you don't do that at networking events. I know pretty much everyone in my industry in, in, in the States. 
I know the CEO of every single company that will acquire our company in the future. I know them personally and well. And those are the people that I believe the entrepreneurs should focus on, on, on meeting, spend time in their industry and not in entrepreneurs or technology events. Yeah, it's very um, easy to waste time in those entrepreneur events with just having beers and not really getting anywhere. Yeah, you know, talking about ideas and not being at the office executing and then spending, you know, a lot of money and time on, on, on these events that they take you nowhere. I'm not against those events, but I think those events are for people. Like when I was at JP Morgan and I wanted to start a company, I would go to those events because I wanted to meet entrepreneurs that were doing what I wanted to do. But once I start doing that, I didn't need to go to those events anymore. I had to stay working and focus on my industry. And I will go to events where my clients were because I wanted to sell to those guys. To raise money, I think you need to first make sure that you are operating in a market that is large enough to attract investors. Second, I wouldn't waste time in Silicon Valley. I see a lot of entrepreneurs that go to Silicon Valley and take a picture at at the Apple garage, Steve Jobs <laughs> garage. That's a waste of time and money. Don't go to Silicon Valley because investors in Silicon Valley don't care about Brazil. And third, I will focus on business models that actually solve the Latin American problems. I personally don't believe on building global businesses out of Latin America unless the business solves a problem in Latin America first, and then you can outgrow Latin America. Alibaba is, is a great example that I like. If you look at Alibaba, they are one of the largest, I think they are the largest IPO in history. But the difference with Alibaba and some US startups is that Alibaba never started as a true global company. They started solving a Chinese problem. China had a very large domestic market. And because China is so complex, the market is very complex and it's very difficult to raise money. That makes the complexity of the Chinese market keeps the overseas companies entering that market. And on the other hand, the fact that it's really difficult to raise money, if you are a Chinese company that is able to raise money, then your competitive advantage against any other Chinese entrepreneur is massive. So Alibaba had that. They managed to raise money. And the Chinese complexity protected Alibaba you know, from eBay, for example, that struggled a lot to get into China. So they had a very big domestic market that enabled them to grow Alibaba into a monster size. And once Alibaba was big enough, they went outside of China to conquer the global markets. So I believe that Latin America is the same. We have markets like Brazil that are extremely complex. They are very big. They are large markets. And it's really hard to raise money. So if you can raise money for Brazil, or for a large Latin American market, just focus on that market first. Don't expand before you become a large company. That, that, that's what I will do. And to raise money, you need to make sure you are, you are in a large market and you are solving a real problem that exists in that market. And so you said you would advise Latin Americans not to go to Silicon Valley because they're not really interested. What, what would you tell the investors in Silicon Valley or New York about why they should maybe take a look at some companies in Brazil or in the rest of Latin America? Because of what I just said, because the next Alibaba could come out of Latin America. There is a quote from the Alibaba guy that says, we are a crocodile on a Janset River, and eBay is a, is a shark in the ocean. So if we fight in the ocean, we will lose. But if we fight in the Janset River, we will win. So it's better to be a crocodile in the Janset River. So... Basically, to investors in Silicon Valley, I will remind them of that, that in, you know, take our business model, for example, the Uber for trucks. If you go to the States, you have at least 20 companies that raise more than $10 million. All of them are chasing the exact same opportunity with exact same technology and the exact same level of offering. They are almost selling a commodity and they are startups. Now, take it here in Brazil. The market is a little bit smaller than the States, the trucking market. But the problem here with trucks is much, much larger. In the States, you have less than 10% of the trucking fleet running empty. Here is 40%. In the States, you have 
a lot of startups chasing the same opportunity here is only us because we are the only ones that manage to raise money and to execute the business. So I believe that to investors in Silicon Valley, I will tell them if I was them, I will look for more potential Alibabas in markets where there is less competition and where the problems are much, much larger. On the subject of advice, knowing what you know now, going all the way back to when you first tried starting a business back in Argentina after leaving JP Morgan, what would you tell yourself from knowing what you know today? I think I wasted too much time on, on useless events. And I also wasted too much time trying to innovate, rather like innovate in a way of building a new business model. I think you asked me what was like the breaking point, at least where we found our way to build a company that actually solved the problem. I, I was in the States once and I met one of our US equivalents that was the founder of Groupon. And the guy did like five IPOs with different companies before Groupon, like in less than 10 years. So I asked the guy, and I think this is probably the most important advice I got as, as an entrepreneur. This was early 2013. We were having a coffee in Chicago and I said, how do you manage to do five IPOs so quickly? Because it's really tough to build a new business and make that business work. Because sometimes you build products that no one wants to use. And he said, because we don't focus on reinventing the wheel, you can start two types of companies. You can start a company like Twitter or Facebook, companies that build a new markets. And when they work, they become like a hundred billion business. But most of the time, those companies don't work. And when they work, you need a lot of money to make them work. Think of Airbnb, for example. You need to, to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to make them work. And most of the time they don't work because people just don't get it or because there is no product market fit. That's one thing you can do. And it's really hard, especially if you're in Latin America. To build a new market is really hard. And if you're in Latin, in Latin America, it's harder. Another type of company that you can build, the guy said, is a company that brings efficiency to a market that already exists. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. In our case, for example, if I go to any industry, the sale to the client is, do you use trucks to move your freight? The answer is yes. Do you pay a lot of money? Yes. So if I can use technologies that exist, like machine learning and mobile technology, to add efficiency to an industry that already exists and that existed for 100 years and that has a business model that is profitable. So if I can bring those technologies that I didn't create it and put those technologies into this industry, which is tracking, and add efficiency to tracking, then I'm going to have a much better business model than the model that already exists. And I don't have the risk that the company is not going to work because this business model has been proved for 100 years. In the worst case scenario, you will just create another tracking company, but you will have a business that works. And that was his advice. He said, we look for traditional industries that hasn't been disrupted. Then we look for technologies that work and we try to find a way to bring those technologies into the traditional industry and make that industry more efficient. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. I mean, it, there's different types of people, different types of entrepreneurs, but at least in my case, it's always been find something that already works and figure out how to move laterally and put it in another industry. That's really good advice. Yeah, so this is what we did, actually. If you look at Cargo X, we are a trucking company. We offer a commodity, which is trucking services. And the sale to my client is really easy. When I go and, and I'm in front of the client, I say, look, you are moving freight with trucks. Let me move. Let me give you one truck and test my service. And by the way, let me give you a price. If my price is lower than what you are paying now, you will do a test with me. There is no reason not to do a test if you are saving money. And if the level of service I'm giving you is better in an order of magnitude at a cheaper cost than the service you are getting, I am sure that you will give me more freight. I'm sure of that because with technology, I'm going to, I believe that I can give you a better level of service. And with the, thanks to technology, I can give you a cheaper cost. That's what I believe. Then I, the client will say, okay, let's try it. Then if what I believe that I can do with technology is real and I can provide a better service at a cheaper cost, there is no reason why the client wouldn't give you more business. So the execution risk 
um, these type of businesses is much, much lower than executing Facebook, Airbnb, Twitter, etc. And so what's next for your business? What do you think are the next milestones and where do you see yourselves going over the next, say, year or two? We will keep growing and adding value to the market where we operate. We have a lot of stuff to do. And maybe after that, we will start expanding internationally to, to other markets. But we believe that we need to have a dominant position in the markets we operate today so that when we give the first step towards the international market, we are strong enough and we don't lose focus. And strong enough means that you have a strong team and you have enough financial resources to keep our domestic Brazilian business running. That's again, that's what Alibaba did before they start expanding very aggressively. Every step they gave internationally, it was a very solid step that wouldn't take the focus out China. And so where can people find more information about you or your company? Cargox.com.br. Perfect. Well, I know you have a lot of stuff going on still this afternoon, so I want to be respectful of your time. Thanks again for taking the time out of your day to do this. I really enjoyed hearing your story and hopefully, you know, maybe six months or a year down the road, we can do this again and get an update. Sure. Would be great. Awesome. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Federico Vega. If you did, please go and subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher, searching Crossing Borders or looking at my website, NathanLustig.com, where I have all of the episodes. And if you really, really enjoyed it, which I hope you did, please give me a rating on iTunes. It really helps out and helps other people find these amazing stories from Latin American entrepreneurs. Thanks again for listening.